stock finished lower on Tuesday, just one day after a big rally drove the S&P to its best daily performance since June. Tech was the big drag on stocks today, with well-known names like Apple, Microsoft, and Facebook all finishing the day in the red. There's been a push and pull on Wall Street lately about the bond market over whether the quick rise in interest rates signals that inflation could get out of hand or just optimistic expectations for a big economic recovery once COVID-19 vaccines roll out to enough people. In D.C., the economic recovery is tied to the $1.9 trillion relief package that Democrats are attempting to push through Congress right now. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer said Tuesday that Democrats plan to pass the bill next week and that they have enough votes to pass it. That's bound to provide a huge jolt to the U.S. economy. But there are several Democratic lawmakers already looking to the next stimulus bill. The COVID relief bill is still winding its way through Congress, but today 10 Democratic senators are laying down a marker for the next stimulus package. They're calling on President Biden to make sure that his massive infrastructure and investment plan includes an extension of unemployment benefits and recurring stimulus checks. And importantly, that those benefits are tied to broader economic conditions. Well, this idea of automatic stabilizers has won the backing of key Senate committee chairmen, Bernie Sanders, Ron Wyden, and Sherrod Brown. In a new letter to President Biden, they wrote, This crisis is far from over, and families deserve certainty that they can put food on the table and keep a roof over their heads. Families should not be at the mercy of constantly shifting legislative timelines and ad hoc solutions. Enhanced unemployment benefits will run out in just about two weeks. The current COVID relief bill would extend them through the end of August, but after that, lawmakers and workers would face another cliff. Now, I've talked to unemployed workers about this, and they told me that they feel burned that their benefits will be cut off at an arbitrary date, and that lawmakers' promises of making those benefits retroactive haven't panned out. So you can see how the fight on Capitol Hill is already starting over what happens after COVID relief gets passed. Well, the reality is that there's actually bipartisan support for the idea of tying these benefits to economic conditions. This is something that Republicans in the Bipartisan Problem Solvers Caucus had supported during previous rounds of COVID negotiations. They called them boosters. But the biggest issue with it is that it can be complicated to explain to both other lawmakers and to the public. And then lawmakers would have to also agree on what the metrics would be for when the benefits would go up or be phased out. So some of the data points that lawmakers are talking about to tie these benefits to would be primarily either the unemployment rate or the employment to population ratio. So that way, if the job market is looking really lousy, then they'd be able to give unemployed workers bigger benefits. Once the job market looks a little bit better, some of those extra supports would then fade away. Uh, the question though is, would this just be in place during the pandemic or are we moving to a system where all benefits are being considered on a sliding scale. And there is differing opinions on how long this type of new policy should last. Okay, let's get to our sound check. In a whole lot of different ways, the fiscal stimulus is going to keep going. The reason the bond market is reacting is because the eventual economic recovery from vaccines that you referred to, Joe, is already discounted in both the equity and bond market. It's the fairest, it's the most progressive, and here's the thing, it helps level the playing field just a little bit. During the month of January, we saw a surge in traffic in our stores. We saw growth across all of our categories. And obviously we saw consumers redeeming gift cards, but really shopping for newness. And we saw a great the response to anything new in our assortment, from home to apparel to beauty throughout our store. Uh, we really saw a great response in January that lifted the entire quarter. Now we brought in more new customers than just that number, but I do think it's it's a great proof point on how well the program's working. We have a great partnership with, with Amazon and we'll look to build it going forward. Bitcoin is having a pretty good 2021 so far. The digital currency has jumped more than 430% since this time in 2020. Just in the past month, Tesla bought $1.5 billion in Bitcoin. Uber CEO said the company is considering it as a form of payment. And Citi advised clients that Bitcoin could become the, quote, currency of choice for global trade. 
Big name Wall Street investors like Paul Tudor Jones and Stanley Drunkenmiller have taken notice of Bitcoin's rise. And now an emerging group of cryptocurrency hedge funds are seeing big returns on their investment in digital currencies. CNBC's Leslie Picker can explain how these crypto focused hedge funds differ from traditional firms and what this newfound interest could mean for the price of Bitcoin. So cryptocurrency hedge funds are hedge funds that invest largely in digital assets and blockchain related securities. This is different from your traditional hedge fund, which a lot of times aren't able to invest in these types of assets due to particular bylaws and restrictions surrounding risk and volatility. Cryptocurrency hedge funds, there's about $2 billion in assets that are devoted just to these specific strategies right now, uh, but their returns have been nothing short of phenomenal. For example, when you look at what they did last year, 196% returns on average. That means some did wildly better than that, some not so great, but in the past five years or so that uh, HFR has been collecting data, they've only really had one year in the red. The best year was 2017, where they produced returns of about 3,000% that year. Earlier this week, we saw Dan Loeb tweeting that he was studying cryptocurrency. We're seeing all of these big banks put out big cryptocurrency reports saying that this thing is here to stay. Just there's this broader acceptance of cryptocurrency among kind of the, the old stewardship of the hedge fund universe, institutional investor universe. Now, what does that mean for Bitcoin? What does that mean for crypto? Well. This year, over the past year or so, just this broader acceptance of people who are involved in more traditional areas of finance uh, has been a boost to cryptocurrency. Every time you hear from someone who, who says that they support this cryptocurrency that may not have otherwise done so, uh, you do tend to see the price of Bitcoin and other digital currencies go higher. Uh, now that said, whether or not they actually apply it within the hedge funds that they have constructed to date is another question. Oftentimes you've got certain bylaws, certain restrictions. This type of thing takes time. Pension funds and other large institutional investors that invest in hedge funds are oftentimes slower to kind of adapt and learn about these new areas and, and have greater acceptance for them because they're managing public money. They're managing money for teachers and firefighters and public workers. And so they don't wanna take on too, too much risk. It's no guarantee that it forces the asset higher. There is of course a scarcity value for Bitcoin uh, and a lot of these other digital currencies. And so, uh, you know, theoretically, if more people are accepting them, if more people are investing in them, that should be beneficial for that price. Uh, but of course, people don't always put their money where their mouth is. People could say they're supportive of it and just kind of study it for years and years to come. Microsoft wants you to join augmented reality meetings with your coworkers. It just unveiled a suite of new software applications for developers called Mesh to make that happen. The software is meant to work with the company's HoloLens augmented reality headset, which will run you about $3,500. But if you don't want to splurge on Microsoft's headset, the company also expects the software to work with PCs, tablets, and smartphones. Microsoft isn't the only one looking into AR as the next big thing. Apple and Facebook are both rumored to be building their own AR headsets to sell to the masses. Next. $1 billion. San Antonio's power company says it owes $1 billion in energy costs after the freak winter storm that crippled Texas last month. The CEO of CPS Energy said in a board meeting that the company racked up $800 million in fuel charges alone and that CPS will try to negotiate the costs down. Many homeowners in the state who managed to keep their power during the storm now face astronomical utility bills too, as fuel prices skyrocket. Shares of rocket companies surged in Tuesday's trading session, and no one's really quite sure why. It didn't report earnings today, and it didn't make any other major announcements. So of course, we're turning to Reddit again. The theory is that traders on Reddit's infamous Wall Street Bets forum have found another target with rocket companies. About 38% of rocket companies' shares are in short positions right now, making it one of the most heavily shorted U.S. companies out there. That's according to data from FactSet.